Hello, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. I came out back to feed my chickens and ducks a snack and thought I would make a short video about a tree in the orchard. You can hear the chickens. Um, our orchard is a U-shaped sun trap. So it runs around the whole perimeter of the property all the way around. And then in the front, it's just a straight up food forest where um, it's all gonna be trees. So the philosophy behind this is that um, none of my fruit trees are going to obscure the sun from annuals and other plants, low growing plants that need the sunshine. So they're all in a U shape around the, around the edge of the property. It works very well. It also allows the trees to kind of obscure the inner part of the garden from the neighbors and also provide some wind protection. So as we go into the orchard, which has at this time more than 40 fruit trees, and I have lost count of how many fruit producing shrubs are in the yard, um, there's a specific tree I want to show you. So I did a video yesterday about peaches and peach leaf curl. And today I want to do a video about uh, another kind of fruit tree that often has problems in the Pacific Northwest. And it is still widely grown here, but it is widely grown with lots of sprays and lots of issues. So I'm going to talk about um, what I grow and why I don't spray. So as we're in the orchard, damson plum, gumi berry, suckle pear tree, fig, medlar, more figs. I have jujubes and quince and apples and more apples. As we go through, uh, there is an Illinois everbearing mulberry, which is just starting to leaf out. So we come down here into the orchard. I hear you. These are my Jude the Obscure David Austin roses. This is my favorite rose. Just about to bloom. They're going to be spectacular and they will bloom twice. And then this is a clematis. Some people pronounce it clematis, but which is probably more correct. I'm a big fan of growing roses and clematis together. I think they complement each other very well. This is going to be a peachy colored rose, so it works really nicely with this pink of this clematis. Okay, so this is the gate. All of our gates are made out of either pallets or just free scrounged stuff. We had to add this little bit at the top. It didn't originally have it because we have one chicken who even with her wings clipped can get over a three um, and a half foot gate. So she, we strung some extra twine and wire up to keep her from jumping out and eating vegetables and scratching up places she wasn't supposed to scratch up. Oh, here we have uh, black currant which works really nicely as a trellis for part of the clematis as well as producing food. Okay, so we're gonna go in here. Oh, hello girls, back up. Okay. So as we come in here, it's really dense right now. Unfortunately, when I plan this garden, the fence really should be farther over to create a bigger pathway. I'm kind of, you come in and you're stuck immediately under a medlar. So the tree I wanna talk about is this tree which is a pear, so it's a seckle pear. You can see here, there's a baby pear set. We're gonna move around this way and not get caught on my rose. Okay, so whew, it rained and now I got real wet. Okay, walking under those trees. So you can see here, there's a lot of pears set. So pears in the Pacific Northwest get fire blight and it is difficult to treat. It kills pear trees rapidly. And um, if, unless you want to spray them heavily, it's hard to grow. And also pretty much the only organic cure is to cut off and remove fire blight. Give you a little view of the bees while I'm talking. Cut off fire blight infected parts of the tree. So just like when I talked about growing peach trees and how I grow varieties that are resistant to peach leaf curl, for pears, as much as I love some of the I love Bartlett pears and Camise and I love all those pears. They're not resistant to fire blight. So what I do grow is a suckle pear. The other name for it is candy pear. It produces a little pear about, or sugar pear I should say, a little pear about this big. 
and they're very, very sweet, excellent dessert pair. And they're actually excellent for canning because they're small. So the pear tree here, suckle pears are self-fertile, so they don't need a pollination partner. And most of the Pacific Northwest folks use Bartlett's for a pollination partner in commercial orchards. That's what they use. Um, because they are compatible with so many other varieties of pear. So suckles, you can grow just one pear tree, it's f resistant to fire blight, produces heavily every year. It is not resistant to cedar apple rust. So sometimes it gets rust on it. You want to prune it in an open shape. So what ha is happening right now is I'm getting this vigorous spring growth. The chickens are all underfoot. So I'm getting all this vigorous spring growth. So this is a small tree. I keep it small. While this spring growth is new, I want to come in and snap off. So I don't even have to use a pruner. All of the extra vertical shoots and make more space for air circulation. And that reduces fungal problems. Um, I also want to come in and remove and destroy anything like this. Here, I'll show you. This is rust on my baby and it will destroy some of the fruit every year, but it's usually not so much. Uh, that it damages the crop significantly and again creating that increased air circulation and not growing things like June berries or um, Things like that that are hosts to it right next to it helps except that this is the Pacific Northwest. So cedar apple rust is pretty ubiquitous Okay, some other things about pears Pear trees. I'll let you look at my knees again while I talk pear trees Produce on spurs on old wood and unlike apples pears often don't produce as many spurs. And if you prune off the existing spurs, you're going to have a tree that doesn't easily produce um, a ton of new spurs. So you wanna be really careful when you're pruning in the fall and winter to not um, prune off those spurs, if that makes sense. So you keep the tree compact, you figure out where the spurs are and that's where you're gonna get a cluster of fruit and they'll produce consistently on those spurs for many years. So a little bit different than other kinds of fruit in that they just don't produce as many spurs and any of the other shoots are not gonna be productive. Also, pear trees have a really wonky habit of trying to grow at a weird shape and you really wanna encourage the branches that are very horizontal and get rid of the ones that are really vertical. They produce spurs better on the horizontal branches and also it fosters that open shape I don't know if you've ever seen a pear tree that's been poorly pruned or not been pruned. They often have a number of vertical shoots that are not, um, hi duck, hi, that are not going to do much for you and don't give a very aesthetic look to the tree. And also those vertical shoots, should they produce spurs on them, snap more easily. A more wide horizontal crook is more stable and can hold fruit better. So that's a look at my pear tree. I can't really back up because it's just so full of plants right now. But that's a Seckle pear tree, S-E-C-K-E-L. Highly productive, self-fertile, fire blight resistant pear tree that is small, fits in a home orchard easily, reliable producer, and a very, very pretty tree. So I hope that helped give you some tips for how to produce one, and how to produce good fruit off of it. Please feel free and like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to my channel and I will be back tomorrow.